session and just listen to him talk about the as is right now like with uh, demo and mock uh, manning and competency uh, all right good morning everybody happy valentine's day there's nothing more romantic than talking about acquisitions and programs on than on valentine's day uh, i'm bill hamlet the editor-in-chief of proceedings at the u.s naval institute it's great to have you all here today uh, i want to thank today's panel sponsor mckinsey and company and I have the pleasure of introducing our moderator for the, this morning's panel, Vice Admiral Tom Moore, U.S. Navy retired, former commander of Naval Sea Systems Command. Admiral Moore is a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy, class of 1981. He holds advanced degrees from George Washington University and MIT. As a surface nuclear officer for 13 years, he served in various operational and engineering billets in 1994. He was selected for lateral transfer to the engineering duty officer community where he served in various staff engineering maintenance, technical and program management positions. He commanded program executive office for aircraft carriers from 2011 to 2016. And during this five year period, he led the largest ship acquisition program in the US Navy portfolio. He was responsible for designing, building, testing and delivering Ford class carriers he led the Navy's first ever inactivation of a nuclear-powered aircraft carrier, the USS Enterprise, rest in peace, uh, and was the lead in the U.S.-India Joint Working Group Aircraft Carrier Techno Technology Cooperation, and he became the 44th Commander of Naval Sea Systems Command in June 2016. Admiral Moore, thank you for being with us today. The panel is yours, sir. Well, thanks, Bill, for that kind of introduction. It's been about three and a half years since I uh, realized I actually did all that stuff. So first of all, um, we're going to have a great panel this morning. Um, but I want anybody who sat, th first of all, I apologize up front. If you sat through Admiral Paparo's um, keynote address there, uh, we'll try and be that good, but it's going to be pretty, pretty, pretty difficult to, to match that. That was okay. really, really outstanding. Um, it's a pleasure to be up here. Uh, Pete Daly's not here. I did want to give a shout out to him after his many years of service and also to Ray Spicer for taking over at the Naval Institute. Um, Pete was a longtime mentor of mine. In fact, in the realm of be careful what you ask for, after this panel last year, I was in the back and I said to him, hey, you know, if you ever need a moderator, you know, let me know. And uh, in November, I got the, I said, holy cow, he remembered. And uh, so here I am. So my role here is to really today is to kind of facilitate the discussion uh, my, my opinions don't matter. Um, we have a lot of the leaders in the acquisition community today. Um, uh, Admiral Chebby had to head back uh, uh, to, to manage uh, some issues with V-22, um, but he's going to be uh, well represented by Admiral Hash. And um, I actually requested uh, Admiral Donnie not be on the panel this morning because I didn't want every answer to be, well, I've got some problems left over from my predecessor. 
Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna pass that uh, baton over to to Admiral Dick Dickinson as well. Um, so let me just go down the line real quick. We've agreed uh, we're not gonna bore you with the, the detailed bios like you, you heard about mine, and we'll get started in the panel. The idea is to kind of we'll make we'll kind of go have questions, reattack for you know 45 minutes to an hour, and then open the floor up uh, to your questions. So uh, starting uh, to my left. Uh, Admiral Doug Small, probably uh, well known to you, he's the commander of the Naval Warf Info Warfare Systems Command, a lifelong engineering duty officer, a lot of significant experience in, in the combat systems world, he's a former PEO IWS, and uh, he's got this little thing called Project Overmatch today that he's uh, kind of working for the CNO. Uh, to his left is uh, Admiral Chad Jacoby, who is the Assistant Commandant for Acquisition and is the Chief Acquisition Officer, CG9, uh, for the U.S. Coast Guard. Uh, he previously served as the PEO and Director for Acquisition, um, Integration and Weapons, and the Chief of Mission Support, uh, and has served in a wide range of engineering and logistic jobs in support of various U.S. Coast Guard, uh, the U.S. Coast Guard Operational Fleet. To his left, uh, Brigadier General David Welsh, who's the commander of the Marine Corps Systems Command, uh, a Naval Aviator, uh, AH-1 Whiskey Pilot. He's commanded at every level. He was the uh, lead test pilot on the H-1 program and led development of flight testing for AH-1 Zulu and the UH-1 Yankee, and also PEO land system. So wealth of experience on the Marine Corps side of the house. To his left, uh, Admiral Tom Dickinson, who is in charge of the Navy's nine warfare centers. Uh, he's a surface warfare acquisition prof professional. He has commanded at sea and significant experience in the ES uh, ballistic missile defense realm. And then finally to his left uh, is uh, Admiral Keith Hash, who was the uh, NOC weapons Division and also the assistant for test and evaluation for Nav Air, uh, naval aviation, uh, naval aviator with uh, significant experience in the E2C Char in the E2 Charlie, E2D world, uh, and led the E2D program in its IOC. So, uh, with that being said, I, I did want to uh, remark if you didn't listen to um, Admiral Baparo this morning, uh, pretty pretty powerful, uh, and I think it's a, probably a, a pretty good way to kick off. A panel on acquisition, which is uh, the world is quickly descending into chaos and disorder. The behaviors are not random. Uh, these are changes we have not seen in a hundred years, and that was echoed yesterday by Admiral uh, Swift, who had also had the job where he, you know, basically said, "I haven't seen uh, this amount of challenges in in my lifetime," and I think that's, uh, you know, frankly, pretty pretty true. And if you're talking about the CNO's priorities, and when she talks about foundations. I think the foundations of a lot of what we're trying to get after today in terms of getting things out to the warfighter begins with the acquisition community and the leaders you see to my left. So with that, uh, I'd like to kick it off uh, with the first kind of question. And what I'm going to do with this one is just throw it out to the entire group, give them about three to five minutes to kind of explore big picture themes on this, and then uh, we'll go from there. So uh, I think uh, you know the, the title of this whole conference uh, is pretty apropos given where we are today and the, and the title of this panel is Acquisition Innovating and Adapting to Meet the Differing Requirements Presented Near-Term and Long-Term. So, is it? And so I'll start with Abel Small and we'll work our way down the line. So Doug, over to you. Well, I think, you know, to answer the question directly, I'll just, you know, state what Admiral Paparo said. We're never going to be satisfied. I think there are areas where we are moving pretty quickly. Um, and I, I have some examples. I do, I do want to start with a little bit about NAVWAR. For those of you who don't know us, we are the Navy's geek squad. We're the, we're the crowd that kind of strings together all the rest of the stuff that gets delivered to the Navy and Marine Corps uh, afloat and ashore. So we, we're, we're big in cyber networks, communications, you name it, about 11,000 people all over the globe. Our priorities are CNO's priorities, war fighting, war fighters, and foundations, and we have a big hand in all of that. In terms of what we do at NAVWAR, number one priority is the people that work at NAVWAR. Uh, second is readiness, like any systems command. And the third is that geek squad work that we do with uh, digitalization and um, Admiral Moore mentioned uh, project overmatch and things like that. Um, you know, a few examples of places where we, we are, um, you know, we're, we're, in some cases, we, we were even ahead of uh, capability being delivered. Um, for those of you who've been following the uh, work of uh, Starlink, right, we, when, when I first got here, there was no uh, PLEO constellation 
that you could uh, put antennas on every single ship uh, before they deployed. And now we put three of them on aircraft carriers and one on every other ship that's deployed and, and have pulled the commercial industry along in terms of what is it that the Navy needs to be able to use these things as uh, transport for warfighting information. Uh, we are a fully fledged software factory delivery machine now, have delivered hundreds of applications over the air to ships at sea, trained you know, hundreds of sailors on how to use these things, and it's, that is just the way we now do business. Um, Project Overmatch, you know, we've, we've been running with scissors on getting stuff delivered to the fleet. Um, and then you know, another, another thing that we don't talk about often enough is the work of and the enterprise networks and our between PEO, MLB, and the work that they've done in Ready Relevant Learning and, and a lot of the other uh, maintenance applications and things. And then PEO Digital and the work on flank speed and you know, getting us to world-class network performance. Um, it's been a pretty incredible journey uh, getting toward focusing on what is the user experience associated with that and improving across the board. So yeah, there's plenty of areas where we are moving at pace. We will never ever be satisfied um, that we can um, go fast enough, but it's a whole, it's a whole system uh, required to do that. Okay, thank you. Chad? Morning everyone. So my answer would be yes, we are innovating. Um, the fleet that the Coast Guard's building is much more global and much more integrated, interchangeable with the Navy than we ever have before. Probably the biggest example, um, at weighing in at 23,000 tons, is the polar security cutter that the Coast Guard and the Navy uh, have a joint program to build. So the nation hasn't built a heavy icebreaker in over 50 years, and we're going after not just icebreaking requirements, but a ship that can conduct all the Coast Guard missions anywhere around the world any season. So not just breaking ice, but maritime law enforcement, marine environmental protection, search and rescue, defense operations anywhere in the world. Also inside the Coast Guard, uh, the acquisition programs have always been separated uh, by acquisition and sustainment executed in two different parts of the Coast Guard. And quite often we did hull mechanical and electrical ship design in one phase and we did C5 design in another phase. I guess we had the luxury of doing that in the past where sometimes we could say, okay, we'll figure out the ship structure and then we'll worry about the C5 later. Uh, with these new ships we're designing, it's clearly not possible to do that. We're having to bring the C5 and the HM&E design uh, in parallel with each other. And then bridging the gap between sustainment and acquisition, I guess we used to be able to think of acquisition as a finite task that you would do for 10 years and then be done and walk away. Uh, the new ships we're designing and building, uh, we have the national security cutters uh, out there operating. Uh, we're still building the 11th one, and the first one is 15 years old, so it's ready to come in for a major maintenance availability. So these ships uh, are not done being produced before they need to come back in for obsolescence management. Uh, and so I, I see these programs not exiting the acquisition cycle. Uh, so we're setting up a life cycle management concept in the Coast Guard. John? All right, thank you. So uh, I'll start just by talking a little bit about Marine Corps Systems Command and, and what we do as opposed to the Naval Systems Command. So obviously we, uh, we, we are Marine Corps down at Quantico and we buy the ground and IT equipment for the Marine Corps and, del and deliver those capabilities in conjunction with PO Land Systems, PO MLB, and PO Digital. So we make sure our Marines have what they need, the capabilities they need, when they need it. I think that's the really the topic and the imperative today is the when they need it part of it. So I'll talk just a little bit about a couple of focus areas for Marine Corps Systems Command and a couple of initiatives we have going. As goes without saying that the people are really the basis of Marine Corps Systems Command and all of our SISCOMs. Without the right workforce, we cannot deliver those capabilities. So we are um, actively working to get the right people in, supported by our Navy, 
uh, warfare centers as well and our industry partners. So we look for partnerships across industry, looking for those innovative ideas, and a lot of times it's really industry that is innovating uh, with our technology along with our labs and Marine Corps Warfighting Lab, Naval Research Lab. So looking to partner with our uh, partners across industry, across the Marine Corps, across the Naval Enterprise, and also with our international partners. We spend a lot of time working to align capabilities with them, see where they're headed, make sure we're interoperable, interchangeable with them. All with the intent of getting our Marines what they need when they need it. Some things we're doing initiative-wise to make that, uh, to get faster at that. One is working closely with McWill and our uh, Capabilities Development Directorate to establish a transition team, a fusion cell, that'll help pull initiatives, pull technologies from the low TRL S&T world and transition them quickly into a program of record. So having some headlights into S&T and early R&D from the acquisition side to set up the budget, set up the programs, and make that smooth transition as the technology matures. Another one is modernizing the syscom. We've done some reorganization looking to make the workforce more mobile, more agile between programs as the Marine Corps learns and we shift our priorities. We can move the acquisition workforce to support those as best we can. Also looking to consolidate some of our programs along with PO land systems to make sure that we're looking at a large capability system focused acquisition device, individual stovepipes for individual types of, of uh, um, systems and, and uh, equipment. And finally, changing the culture, taking a more risk-focused culture, getting uh, rid of some of the risk aversion, being comfortable, just not just in the acquisition community, but across the bigger acquisition enterprise with, with our PNR partners and the PPE process, with um, our capabilities development director and requirements, so we can take some risk in either cost and maybe not squeeze every dime out of a contract in order to make sure that we're getting um, the right capabilities out on time. So going for effectiveness over efficiency in our contracting process. Making, working with our fleet partners and our capabilities development directorate to try and um, get to a solution that is 80 or 85 percent of the, 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 the goals uh, capability now, get out there now, with a plan to iterate and deliver the rest of capability over some time period in the future. And then on the business side and acquisition, getting uh, past some of the technical uh, risk aversion, some of the contracting risk aversion that really slows down pro programs. All it takes partnerships with the folks in the room here, with our partners across the acquisition community, so we can come to that best solution, that collaborative solution to deliver capabilities faster. All right, good morning. So I'll start off with uh, just highlighting that our sailors and Marines are the best warfighters on the planet, and it's the uh, responsibility of the acquisition community uh, to, to provide them with the best systems, weapons, platforms. Uh, so when Admiral Small was uh, talking about uh, you know, the foundation, uh, the acquisition community is absolutely part of that foundation supporting uh, warfighting and the warfighters. Uh, for the Warfare Center Enterprise, uh, we have over 15,000 scientists and engineers, uh, more than half of the Navy's total science and uh, engineering expertise, um, hundreds of PhDs, uh, so innovation is in our DNA. We're, we're the technical, uh, we're the bridge between the technical community and the, uh, and the warfighter. Uh, so I see innovation across all the warfare domains from undersea uh, to surface, to air, cyber, space, with a ribbon of information warfare that cuts through each of those domains. Uh, and across the 10 divisions, we have uh, 145 uh, technical capabilities that we specialize in. And, uh, and provide that innovation in its full spectrum. Everything from basic science to program of record uh, development and procurement uh, through in-service uh, sustainment. Uh, so I, th I think the answer is yes. Uh, from my perspective in terms of is innovation alive and well in the Warfare Center Enterprise, I do believe the answer to that is yes. And it's encouraging to see a lot more uh, focus on fleet integration, rapid uh, tech transition and experimentation. A couple good examples of that are uh, the work out in Task Force 59, uh, where we've had over 60,000 hours at sea, uh, 34 different uh, operations, events, and exercises, over 23 different platforms there in theater. Uh, the Fourth Fleet hybrid campaign event, uh, where we've evaluated unmanned systems and advanced kill chains. 
uh, down SouthCom and, uh, and a countless number out in the Pacific uh, in the same vein. So I think that's absolutely critical, our role, you know, getting technology in the hands of warfighters so they can, they can play with it, learn, learn from it, understand how to use it, uh, you know, sense the environment, understand, you know, how to use that and act, uh, act upon it and go forward. Um, and I just close by saying, you know, it's a really strong team. It's a, I'm really proud of the talent that we have across the Warfare Center Enterprise. Uh, but we can't do our mission without the partnership that we have here with industry, uh, you know, with our acad academic partners and other government organizations. Uh, that's all I got. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Hey, good morning, everybody. So, uh, Naval Air Systems Command. Uh, we have facilities all across the country and around the world. Uh, Naval Air Systems Command is headquartered in uh, Patuxent River, Maryland, uh, and we have two warfare centers. Uh, the Aircraft Division, which is aligned there with the headquarters, and also has uh, opportunities up in uh, New Jersey uh, and down in, in Orlando. Uh, we have the Weapons Division, uh, which is what I command out on the West Coast, uh, where we have most of our uh, proponents of our people in China Lake and then Point Magoo, but we have folks spread throughout the country supporting weapons integration and other efforts. Uh, and then we have the Fleet Re uh, Readiness Centers, uh, which is our, our, the third, our third uh, Echelon 3 command that uh, sets up our depots and our intermediate maintenance across uh, the country and around the world to make sure that our air platforms and weapons are uh, ready to go and serviceable back to the warfighters every single day. So large command focused on those key capabilities. Um, at, at NAV Air Syscom, you know, we're very focused on fleet outcomes. Uh, Admiral Chevy's done a great job of bringing us and aligning us uh, with our stakeholders, our fleet stakeholders, and with our OPNAV stakeholders to make sure that we understand what those outcomes are and that we're delivering to those. And we're very focused on partnerships to make those outcomes a reality. And so a lot of those partnerships are with you, many of you sitting out here with industry, uh, making sure that we are aligned and we're focused on those outcomes. Uh, we each have our own perspectives of how we get there and we have needs to get there, uh, but that partnership is critical. We've done assessments on what the root causes to some of our issues have been why are we delivering capability? 70% of our capabilities are delivering late, and we're focusing on removing that, and that is a partnership together to make sure that we're looking for the root cause and understand. For the NAVAIR team, we're focused on three uh, key areas, delivering capability, availability, and affordability. Uh, if you've been with the Naval Air Aviation Enterprise, uh, any of our journey, we started the availability track about six or seven years ago when General Mattis then challenged both the Navy and the Air Force to bring our, our TAC Air community up to 80% readiness. Uh, we learned, uh, specifically with the F-18 Hornets, and then spread it across the naval aviation. And we've been on that journey for, you know, like I said, six, six to seven years now on how we understand the root causes of what the problems were. We align leadership on, on uh, supporting and removing barriers for the teams, and we're focused on the outcomes for the fleet. Not the outcomes of individual stakeholders, but the outcomes on the fleet on the flight line on the ships and in land at sea. Uh, and so those, we've learned a lot through that. And from that availability journey, we not only got readiness for the Hornets, but we spread that across naval aviation on any given day, we're 75 to 80% ready, ready to go and support Admiral Paparo and his demands uh, and the rest of the uh, COCOMs uh, throughout the world. So we spread that beyond that, affordability, looking at how can we uh, take cost out of the system while we deliver that game-changing capability. Uh, and we're doing, had been a couple year journey on that, and we're already taking over a billion dollars out of the system. We can reinvest into those shortcomings that are in naval aviation. Uh, we talked about earlier, if you heard Apple Paparo, the resources are not necessarily growing, uh, but how do we change what we do to find resources to solve those problems inside the fit up? We're not having to go to Congress and wait four to five years, and we're seeing progress in that area. And finally, we're taking the most challenging step now into capability, and so that we can deliver the capabilities on time. And then, like I said, at a cost that we can afford to our warfighters, what they need, when they need it. And you've heard several of my peers up here say the same thing about how we're going after that. Some examples of what we're doing, both near term and long term. Uh, if you've heard the joint simulation environment, an opportunity to support uh, in, in, uh, initial operational test and evaluation for F-35 is a high fidelity environment where we can truly understand what the F-35 can do uh, in complex uh, threat environments. We are now going beyond F-35, integrating the rest of the Navy and now Air Force uh, platforms, uh, both air and surface and weapons, to make sure that we can use that quality environment for the future uh, current programs and future programs. But even today, we have uh, service forces that are deployed. 
uh, we have uh, air wings that, that are in the Red Sea today, and they had an uh, urgent request. How could they increase the capacity of critical weapons on F-18 Hornets uh, to meet the demands of what they're seeing uh, at, the, at the hand of the Houthi rebels and defending the ships, uh, both commercial and military in that area? And in a few months, across the warfare centers and across uh, the Navier community, we solved that problem and were able to double the amount of uh, critical weapons they needed on those platforms. Uh, we didn't have to go do more flight tests. We, we sat down with the engineers, did analysis, understood it, and we felt we had the data and, and gave them that opportunity, and now they're using it in action and supporting uh, their objectives at sea. We're doing this a lot through changing our culture. Uh, culture to incentivize and rewarding the behaviors that drive agility and innovation throughout our, our teams. We're challenging assumptions, we're embracing the red, we're being data-driven, we're thinking differently, and we're listening and we're learning uh, as we go along. It's a growth mindset. We know we're not quite getting it right, but we're getting better every single day, and we're learning and applying those lessons learned back in, into what we're doing. Um, People, you know, he said, we are resource constrained. And so a lot of times when you see a problem, I need more people, I need more uh, resources to go, go make that happen. Uh, that's not the approach we're taking. The approach we're taking is challenging teams to, to look at what is the root cause of the problem you have, to set aggressive and specific targets about what it's gonna take to fix that problem, uh, to then take it, the action so we can track our progress to it and then performance to plan and holding ourselves accountable to that. And we're seeing progress that in many ways. I personally am leading a few pilots in capability where we're taking months out of the acquisition timeline uh, for, tar for weapons and for uh, platforms delivering software on an iterative basis. Now, what does that help? That helps us build the margin for when those things happen that we know happen in acquisition. You're going to have discovery. You're going to have roadblocks. You're going to have barriers that get in your way. When they come, they normally just make us go to the right and delay further and further. We're finding when we build that margin, we're actually still delivering when the fleet, fleet needed it because we built the margin by taking out the, the white space that we could and really fo focusing on the, on the how we get there, the yes if answers. And so we are not experts at it. We are learning and we are growing. Uh, we're building that culture throughout our whole Syscom and I'm looking forward to continuing to build that with our partners uh, with across the, the enterprise of the Navy our joint force, our ally force, and especially with our industry partners as we work together to build our future. Okay. Well, thanks for that first round. I want to follow up a little bit. Uh, General Walsh mentioned uh, transition teams. The Marine Corps are using S early S&T and R&D, and also um, changing the culture on risk aversion. In fact, he mentioned effectiveness over efficiency, which is also what um, Abel Paparo mentioned this morning about the investment industrial base. So I want to start uh, back with NAVC. Um, what is the what is NAVC doing relative to early S and T and R and D uh, and risk aversion change in the culture similar to what the Marine Corps is doing? And I'll let you start there. And if anybody else in the other Syscoms want to jump on board after that, they can, they can, they can. So Tom, over to you. Yeah. So speaking from a uh, early S and T perspective, warfare each one of the ten divisions uh, across the warfare centers do have um, you know dedicated PhD scientists engineers uh, focus on not just basic science, but basic science that's relevant without getting into uh, specific capabilities, understanding what a, a war fighting requirement is and uh, kind of reverse engineering that backwards. We have a workforce that isn't, uh, you know, they aren't generalists. Uh, they're the best in their fields, whether that's uh, quantum computing, um, uh, bioscience. You know, if you look across uh, our different te cap technical capabilities, you'd just be awestruck at, at some of the uh, uh, expertise that, that we have there. So making sure that our basic science is tied to, uh, uh, to requirements and, uh, and not just uh, kind of in a generalist motion is, is part of the Warfare Center focus. Um, I'd also say that, you know, we're completely aligned with SECNAV in terms of, of opening up our door uh, to small business and getting non-traditional partners who are really good in niche markets, uh, uh, non-traditional vendors uh, through OTAs, getting them quickly involved in efforts um, in the S&T realm as well. Um, on the NAVC05 side, so the chief engineer side of, of uh, NAVC, we have a lot of really strong collaboration uh, in motion right now with uh, you know, additive manufacturing, for example, uh, with additive manufacturing, we've uh, 
already certified over 500 uh, parts. We, we have a policy in place now where it's authorized to additively manufacture low criticality parts. So as long as uh, you know we have a, uh, a requirement met in terms of form, fit, and function, uh, you know the fleet has the green light to produce those those parts. And, and uh, across our platforms, we've had over 4,000 parts uh, produced via additive manufacturing. And we've got a long ways to go there. Um, you know, in terms of collaboration, we have an other transaction authority through uh, Mystic, um, a consortium that uh, basically incentivizes industry to come in. And if you own the intellectual property on uh, something that's 2D, you know, making it 3D printable, uh, they just had a two and a half million award, you know, recently for that for folks to come in and uh, contribute there. Uh, also in NAV CO5, uh, you know, we found some great success with, you know, basic science like cold spray. You know, we've avoided uh, recently a $4 million dry docking uh, through the use of cold spray. Um, and uh, on USS uh, Baton, another kind of discrete example, uh, we had a stainless steel, uh, a stainless steel part as, as bigger, a part of a bigger uh, $400,000 mechanism that a supplier no longer makes. We were able to produce that on the ship uh, and say, and it was only about a thousand bucks to produce that part. So there's a lot of, uh, of uh, you know, potential there. Uh, we have really strong uh, relationships with, uh, you know, emerging uh, experts in industry, whether it's, you know, Philips on the added manufacturing side, 3M for corrosion, uh, a number of the larger companies and then we're, we're really encouraging small business to get in that space as well to help us think creatively. Um, so I guess to kind of wrap that up, uh, the Warfare Center Enterprise has incredible PhD level basic science talents, talent that is tied to technical capabilities that matter to the Navy and the Marine Corps. And then we have really strong collaboration through our chief engineering office to industry uh, so that we can leverage all the technology that's out there to keep our ships ready and avoid a lot of cost. Okay, anybody else want to chime in on that? I'll just yep. add just a little bit to that. If you heard Secretary Girton speak yesterday morning at breakfast, he mentioned a little bit about the Valley of Death and his view on that. And he really presented two barriers to that. One is aligning the funding, and the other was maturing technology and sustainment enterprise to come along to make it an enduring capability. So as we see a lot of experimentation, really good experimentation going on with Marine Corps Warfighting Lab, uh, industry, the fleet, that stuff as it, we try and work with our, closely with our CDD partners, and this is the fusion cell piece of it, bring CDD, our requirements owners in, so they can align the, the resources we have for s and to capabilities that will yield something to fill a warfighting gap for our Marines. Then bring in the PNR piece of it, another part of fusion cell, to make sure the budget, so to, kind of cover down on Secretary Girton's one of the obstacles of having the money aligned. So we'll align that money through the FIDIP to transition that capability, bring the acquisition team in to help mature that technology, uh, check off any acquisition regulatory things we can early in the program so we don't get stuck as we make that transition with acquisition regulatory constraints, and then pull it all the way through to a warfighting capability with sustainment with the enterprise lined up to make that an enduring capability. I just, I guess, uh, you know, all of that, and I think one of the other um, cool things that we've been seeing over the last few years is this kind of uh, focus on, CNO talked yesterday about unleashing the creativity of sailors and Marines um, with, with some of these capabilities. And we've, at NAVOR, uh, my predecessor actually set us on a path to where everybody gets up to speed on data science, and data analytics, and foundations of AI and things like that. And with the advent of flank speed and some of the enterprise tooling that we have, as well as the Jupiter and Advana and all these other sort of world-class uh, uh, data capabilities, it's unbelievable what people can do with those capabilities. And, and add that to the robotic process automation, sort of low-level AI stuff that we've been working on. It's pretty neat to watch um, the entire organization kind of embrace these, these capabilities across the board. And then sailors at sea giving giving um, you know data science capability to uh, you know deploying strike group staffs 
what they are able to do with the education that they have in data science and analytics is absolutely incredible to watch. So it's not always about, can I get the latest widget and get it transitioned? A lot of times it's how can we work better to unleash the creativity of the human beings that we have in all these places. So that was my input. Thanks. Okay, shifting gears just a little bit. Um, we all lived with the FAR over the years. Um, probably most of us have been a little bit frustrated with it uh, every now and then. Um, so what needs to change in the, in the acquisition process to deliver capability more rapidly than we're given today? You can use the FAR, you can use anything that's uh, you know, kind of a written law today. Uh, happy to take in examples. Please limit yourself to no more than three. Um, so I will uh, start with the Coast Guard and Admiral Jacoby. Anything um, that you'd like to see changed in the acquisition process that would help you get capability out to the Coast Guard faster? Yes, sir. So the Coast Guard kicked off a task force uh, about a year ago to look at contracting and procurement across the Coast Guard. Uh, we actually reached out to 220 vendors and suppliers that worked with the Coast Guard. So thank you for giving us input uh, into this task force. They they uh, concluded with 22 recommendations that would help us uh, execute not just the major acquisitions, ships and aircraft and C5 systems, but all of the smaller procurements that happen around the, around the country, around the globe. So some of those you know, center on better data tools, um, you know, the contracting organization, the contracting tools were established 20 years ago probably. Um, and we ended up with a segmented, kind of regionalized contracting workforce. Uh, so better tools to understand the, the big picture, uh, recommendations for category management, where we put some governance in place to see what we're buying and how we could group that into categories, maybe a little bit of standardization of product and service requirements. We're also gonna elevate the role of the head of contracting authority in the Coast Guard um, to put that person with the warranting authority higher up to be on par with the other assistant commandants. So uh, suppliers and vendors should see over the next year as we implement these, uh, reduction in pop-up uh, smaller procurements and contracts and a little more strategic view of what the Coast Guard needs and how that could be mapped out uh, across the fiscal year and into larger contracts that should provide a little more consistency and predictability for industry. Okay, Emma Hash. Yeah, so, you know, Cross Enabler Systems Command, I don't know that we have a list of FAR changes we'd get after because we kind of look at the problem a little differently. Um, we don't really see any barriers that we can't come across. We have a lot of authorities. We have a lot of opportunities. We have a lot of options. The key is, are we innovatively using them? And the most important part of using them is partnerships with industry once again. Uh, we can move quickly if we do it together. We can do things fast if we align on the outcomes we're trying to get to and then we work through the process effectively together and we make sure communications are robust. Um, just an example, a few years ago uh, when Admiral Gahagan was PEOT, he challenges contracts people to deliver contracts, far regular contracts in 60 days. Uh, that's not the norm. He challenged them to do it by aligning who is the supported commander, and that was the contracting officer. And so everybody else was supporting the contracting officer. The contracting officer wasn't hounding and trying to find things out. It wasn't calling industry over the day. When it was your turn to deliver, you were accountable to deliver, and they robustly made sure that happened. They took a lot of white space out, and they did start delivering contracts in 60 days. Did they deliver every contract? I mean, you have major multi-years and things like that that take time to really understand. But a lot of your contracts, you can, don't have to take 180 days or 360 days to award. So I think there's opportunities for us to identify those barriers and leadership is aligned to remove those barriers and to use this trade space we have available within the authorities we have available, uh, whether they FAR, whether there are other tra transaction authorities and other ways to go tackle it. Uh, but I think that's where we're, we're really focused at Naval Air Systems Command is, hey, what team, what barrier do you have and how do we start taking those barriers away so you can run and be innovative? And we're looking for those great ideas, a partnership with industry. What are the great ideas that you have? To, you know, disruptive technology, how can we move forward? Um, Naval Air System Command this last year, some of you hopefully were a part of it, put out a, a broad area announcement about disruptive capability to deliver in the next 12 to 18 months. And 
we've got white papers that have been coming in and we're assessing those now. Uh, looking forward to that. And then we owe you stable requirements and stable funding. You heard Admiral Paparo talk about that this morning as well. Uh, that's difficult. It is, but it's not impossible. It's a barrier that we can work toward and we can align to to get the critical things out we need, we need to get done. I've seen teams do it, uh, and I've seen that it's, there's variance in how those teams across Naval Air System Command and probably across all the SISCOMs execute, and we're trying to remove that variance as we, uh, we learn and grow as a team. Okay. General Walsh? Yeah, I, think. Yeah, I, I echo a lot of what Brownie said. I think FAR-wise and the acquisition process at large, we have, Congress has given us a lot of authorities over the last several years. We need to be better at taking those contracting acquisition strategies and applying them in the best way we possibly can to get to industry as quickly as we can. So that's that's on us. That's uh, just like Brownie said, inside Marine Corps Systems Command, it's an education process. It's a it's a little bit of that risk taking again of doing something differently, uh, working closely with our industry partners to because contracting is a two way street, right? So working closely with our industry partners for them to take a little bit of risk to come to us and get to that at that optimal contracting acquisition strategy that delivers those capabilities for our Marines. All that, and transition out of far a little bit more towards PPB process, we get constrained by the PPB process, the colors of money, um, the life cycle of money uh, fairly often. That, that constrains our opportunities for multi-year buys and block buys and those types of things. So we're also looking for opportunities to work with the PPB process and our programming resourcing folks if you're uh, familiar with the PPB Commission interim report that came out, there are a lot of great ideas in there, some of which we can get after right away, some of which are going to take some, some work with, with Congress. But we have started doing some of that um, over in NAVC, I think it's POIWS, and over on the Marine Corps side, PO Land Systems, with portfolio PEOs looking to bundle capabilities into a portfolio PEO that will give us a little bit more authority for reprogramming inside those PEOs and for look for efficiencies in the budgeting process as well. Okay, thanks. Anybody else want to touch that one? We, we don't have any contracting issues at NAVBOR. <laughs> <laughs> you need to come see me later. Um, okay. Um, so uh, we did touch a lot on contracting there, and since Admiral Small doesn't have any problems with contracting, I'll skip over him on this uh, question. But um, I think it's fair to say, uh, having said on both sides of the fence, uh, you know, contracting is um, kind of the bridge between industry and uh, and the acquisition community. And I think you it's safe to say there's probably some frustration on both sides of, of the fence. So I want to get after some, and I'll, I'll throw this open to everybody, and anybody wants to take the first crack at it, you can. You know, what role does the contracting process play in getting things quickly to the operator? Uh, what tools are available to perhaps streamline that process today? And are there other non-traditional contracting vehicles that are available that uh, perhaps we could be using that would help uh, with uh, getting things out to the fleet faster than we are today? So anybody want to take first crack at that? I'll break the seal. Okay. So, I mean, it's absolutely critical, obviously, like like you said, sir, the uh, the contracting process is how we get more players on the field, and, and that being both capability and actual ready warfighters out, out on the fleet. Um, and I think it's the approach of having it not just as a business function, but having it, you know, having every part of the program management, technical and business together aligned, you know, on the government side, and then transparency and strong comms with industry is how you kind of build a recipe for success. Like any planning process, if you get the planning process right on the front side and have a good strategy, you tend to get better fruit at the end of it. Um, in terms of other tools, I, I mentioned, uh, you know, other than tran other transaction authority uh, example previously, but in our warfare centers, we, we use OT OTAs routinely and we're a working capital fund, so agility is one of our strengths. Like once we get a go time, or a ghost signal from a program or another sponsor, we're able to move quickly, and these OTA vehicles allow us to, you know, turn resources into action uh, very quickly. Uh, Indian Head, you know, that would be in energetics, uh, up in uh, Newport undersea uh, technology, Dahlgren surface warfare in Philadelphia. That's our, you know, we're focused on an in, in sustainment. Up in Crane, Indiana, you know, hypersonics and expeditionary warfare. Uh, microelectronics, which is DOD's center of excellence up there. Uh, so we've seen a great, great amount of success with OTAs in, uh, uh, in that phase of the acquisition cycle. Um, 
Yeah, that's those are my thoughts on that. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. So this is something I think about a lot. You know, the Coast Guard is known for being nimble and able to adjust to what the nation needs, whether it's a war on drugs or hurricanes or oil spills or national defense. But the acquisition cycle in the Coast Guard has always been very rigid. Um, you know, minimizing risk and, and tied to the budgeting process. So um, as General Walsh mentioned, we're going after portfolio management. Maybe we should work together on that. Um, so we've stood up portfolios to manage in-service vessel sustainment. So um, ships that have been delivered from acquisition but need major upgrades. We've stood up a software development portfolio and an in-service system sustainment portfolio. I've got three so far. My fourth one will be aviation system obsolescence management. And we've built a little credibility. We've had this portfolio uh, process for over 10 years now. I feel like we've shown that we can execute funding well. Uh, it does give us some flexibility to target, even in year of execution or year before execution, the highest priorities of the Coast Guard, as opposed to locking in very specific program descriptions, you know, three to five years in advance, and then being being stuck having to, uh, you know, execute in that rigid structure. So I, I'm moving toward portfolio management as much as we can. The other side of that is we're going to have to change the way we budget and, and manage funding. We're going to have to describe things a little more generally, which doesn't always resonate on the Hill. You know, very specific named ships and, and locations resonate well. Um, once you get into portfolios, it's, it's a little more vague, and we've got to get over that hurdle of, of uh, budgeting in a way that allows us the flexibility to get after emerging needs, even you know, close to the year of execution. Thank you. I think your question was, what role does contracting play? And I think it's important to think of contracting as one of the functional areas that contributes to delivering a capability. That's what the program's mission is. It's not to award contracts, it's to deliver capability. That takes a balance between the contracting process, our technical maturity, the sustainability, all that needs to be balanced to deliver that capability to our Marines. So contracting, yep, there's a warrant involved and there's a, a lot of um, rigor involved in that warrant because we want to be good stewards of the taxpayers' dollars, but in the end, we're about delivering capabilities to our Marines. So as we have those conversations, the program managers who are in charge of executing those programs they have a contracting person working for them, they have an engineer, they have a loggy, they have uh, finance folks. It's the program manager's role to integrate all those to get after the cost, schedule, and performance. And in the environment we're in right now, schedule is important because we are driven by a threat. We are driven by the, um, the pace of technology. So schedule trumps right now cost and performance in, I'm speaking in generalities. So there's gonna be trades, we're gonna deliver a capability with, you know, like I said, an 85% capability with a plan to, inter to iterate and deliver more. We're going to uh, award a contract that maybe we didn't spend an extra six months arguing over 1% fee because we want to get it out there to our Marines. And again, that takes partnership with industry to get on the same page with us. But that's the direction that we're heading uh, from Syscom. Yeah, a couple of things uh, to add to all the things they're talking about and Aver Syscom is doing as well. Um, but we're also thinking about innovation. And I want to put a shout out to our small businesses. Uh, so small business innovation research is a great way to innovate. They are a lot of our small businesses come up with amazing solutions and they're agile and we have a quick way to get contracts in place to make that happen. So we really appreciate that opportunity and uh, aligning that with the, the larger needs and aligning with a larger uh, contributors to the defense industrial base. Uh, we're doing other things. We're doing pilots with even our large primes. Uh, one is a pilot with data rights, so we can start to have a, a data strategy, enterprise data strategy, where that allows us to have more government uh, access to the data. If we need to do organic work to support that, if we need to do competition in the future, and what does that look like as we start to, to, to pilot that out, and then does that work or not, and we spread the learning from that. Uh, the other thing is we go to new uh, and, and critical capabilities. 
Uh, an example is EXX, their competitive efforts looking at a fixed price, successive targets. We've done a lot of fixed price and cost plus type development over the years and decades, and we've learned a lot of lessons. This is another alternative that, that's being put out there to try out with successive targets as the uh, fixed price, but the target maybe grow over time depending on uh, what we learn in the development process to share some of that risk across government and industry. Uh, we're working inside our own house to try to uh, speed up our timeline and bring tools in. And then another thing we're doing to get to that demand signal, uh, we have a NAVAIR team that's working on understanding what does wartime logistics look like? What do we need? What are those, some of those contingency requirements that we could start talking to industry about and, and maybe setting up potential you know, pre-understood contract type vehicles that if we've got to press go, uh, we already have started the conversation and we're ready to start moving. Uh, so we've got a few efforts in that innovative space. Uh, some of them will pan out, some of them won't. Uh, but we're going to learn and we're going to grow. And with that partnership that we talked about, it's going to be important as we uh, innovate through that space with contracts. Okay. Wes? So, sir, just to, to pick up on, you know, part of the question was about, you know, other arrangements. And I, I think that, you know, one of the things, actually, Brownie mentioned it earlier, too, we have a lot of authority to use a lot of different ways to enter into the right business arrangement to deliver capability. Uh, in our world, we do a lot of software work. and We, we have and with small business. And so we have vehicles available to be able to do that kind of work. Um, you know, I think one of the other really exciting things to see is the sort of the upstart industries that are kind of, um, uh, you know, changing the game a little bit when it comes to commercial item acquisition. Uh, it's pretty neat. If you, you know, if, if we don't change the way we think about the entire ecosystem of saying, if I want a new capability, I have to spend three to five years developing it first before I can start to procure and deliver, it, it's too late. What we need is things that are ready to go, seeking out those commercial items, get those in the hands of sailors and Marines and, and run from there. So. Okay, yeah, thank you. So we've got about 10 minutes left in this portion of it. So if, you, if you're thinking you'd like to ask a question or you know, start uh, writing those down, we'll get to you in, a, in, a, in about 10 minutes. I, I do wanna kind of stay on this, um, uh, on the industrial base a little bit, there's, there's always a lot of talk of what the government can do better to work with industry. Uh, and now sitting on the industry side of the house, I'll throw this out to the panel. Uh, what advice would you have for industry uh, for to work with your systems commands that would get us to the end state we're looking for, which is more, you know, more rapidly and more, you know, getting uh, technology out to the fleet today. So uh, I'll throw that out. Doug, start with you, and then anybody else that wants to, to tag onto that, Ken. I think that, you know, the first thing is, you know, events like this and industry days and things like that, we, we don't, you know, we do those for a reason and it's because we want to make sure that people understand what are the needs of the acquisition community so that, you know, you, frankly, we want you to invest and, and work on, you know, presenting those kinds of solutions. Communicate. Um, you know, Admiral Moore, when he was NAVC, was always telling us, like, you have to communicate with industry and that is so true. Um, we encourage people to make sure that we're constantly in communication mode of, of explaining what it is that we need to do because we never want there to be a gap in understanding. It's not, you know, I'm, I, I also recognize that's not universally exercised across the, the acquisition community, but it is absolutely the case that we have to communicate and communicate better. Um, I always put out you can contact me if you need to get in contact with somebody. I am on LinkedIn. My email address is douglas.small at navy.mil. Uh, if you need to get contacted to somebody at NAVWAR, send me a note and I will get you connected to the right people um, to make sure that they see what it is um, you know, that you do. Okay? And, and we do it all the time. So we're all trying to build the national industrial base. We're, you know, the Coast Guard's linked in with the Navy on their efforts to, to grow the technical and trade workforce. We're, you know, trying to award multi-year contracts, things like that. But probably the biggest thing, the Coast Guard, or the biggest contribution maybe, is I feel like we're uh, helping to grow smaller companies that might not be able to to win a huge Navy contract today um, by doing a lot of work with smaller shipyards, smaller businesses. Um, you know, we need the ships and aircraft and C5 systems, but we also 
need more shipyards, manufacturing facilities, uh, and companies that can compete for some of the special requirements of government contracts, the documentation requirements. So I have three programs right now that um, you know, are, are being built at smaller shipyards. Uh, if successful, we'll end up with companies that now have certified accounting systems, experience in delivering the documentation, uh, have implemented an earned value management system, and hopefully even have positive CPAR evaluations from the government that uh, allow them to grow a little bit in size and grow a little bit in capability. So the Coast Guard uh, awards about half of its contracts to small businesses every year. That's about $1.7 billion uh, going into the National Industrial Base, but I think kind of going in, you know, at the lower levels and trying to elevate companies while we try to produce assets. Yeah, from the uh, Marine Corps side, I'll echo what Admiral Small said. I think collaboration really is the key to it. So we I try and get out to as many of these types of events as possible, Industry uh, work with industry as closely as we possibly can. Because we know there's a lot of hurdles to getting into the defense industrial base, and it, we make it hard, especially on smaller companies. It's a it's a pretty significant leap to jump in and work with us. So we're looking to hear what your friction points are, what what's your what your frustrations are, and just some transparent communication with us about how we can partner with you better. And that's everything from the technology side, technologies that you are aware of that are being developed that we may not see that will help our Marines and our, our sailors and our, our warfighters. Uh, through our business processes and the things that make it hard for you to do business with us. And then down into individual programs as we're in execution, I'll again echo Admiral Small, if you see barriers, and I tell my team the same thing, if you see barriers, things that are preventing you from getting capabilities to us, elevate it, let us know, because things tend to get stuck in the middle layers of the acquisition organization on the industry side and the government side. And a lot of that can be solved through elevating it. So please, Feel free to contact me, contact our team, and get past those hurdles as quickly as possible. Okay. Uh, last question. So if you're thinking about asking questions, uh, we, and I'm going to pass this to NAVC and NAVR to start and see if anybody wants to talk about it. So you know, we've had a long, rich history of trying to work innovation up through OSD, things like you know DIU and SCO, and we've recently added, uh, Navy's added the Distributed Capability Office, and OSD has Replicator. How is, how is DCO and Replicator, uh, how are they helping you deliver things faster today, NAVC? And I'll, you know, I want to pass that to Navier and then anybody else that wants to answer that, and then we'll open up the floor to questions. Yeah, thanks, sir. So uh, I would say, you know, I, I was going to mention on the previous question, too, just before I, I lose my train of thought, uh, our technical bridges are also a really – uh, important way for those that haven't done business with uh, the Navy or the government, DOD, uh, to understand what problem sets we have and connect uh, with the Navy um, and kind of enter into that business space. So there are 18 tech bridges from Japan to London at each of our 10 uh, divisions for the, uh, for the warfare centers. Uh, if you've heard of Naval X, uh, Naval X kind of runs herd over those uh, those tech bridges, uh, so you'll you'll see a lot of uh, small business development and connective tissue at each of those localized talent. So wanted to make sure I got that out there before I answer that. So uh, NAFC is absolutely involved in in both, and it was interesting because Replicator kind of preceded the announcement for the disruptive uh, capabilities office. Uh, DCO is absolutely where we are looking for disruptive cap capability inside the Navy on CNO staff, uh, where uh, the warfare centers are absolutely involved in uh, disruptive technology across each of those warfare domains, you know, the full span, uh, particularly in information warfare, uh, to give us decision superiority. Um, Raider funds also from, from OSD uh, come our way, so we do a lot of things behind the scenes for disruptive technology through through OSD funding, uh, and those are somewhat uh, there's there's synergy there between OSD Raider fundings and replicator type efforts. Uh, but between additive manufacturing, uh, artificial intelligence, large language models, and 
generative AI, there's so much potential there uh, to get uh, high volume, low cost uh, effectors out there, both kinetic and non-kinetic. Uh, so NAVC is absolutely involved in that. I'd say probably the, the warfare centers and uh, you know, if you think about the uh, the, P the war fighting PEOs, uh, uh, that would be the lion's share at NFC, sir. Okay. So uh, I'll start with a couple things. Um, in the uh, FY24 NDA that was passed, there was actually some line items about establishing a naval a naval aviation uh, rapid capability office, and uh, I don't know what that is yet. And so we're trying to figure out what that means. Uh, there's a lot of rapid capability offices out across the DOD. We just talked about the DCO and replicator, and our job is to align and work through what that means and where do we bring something unique. So uh, that's going to become an opportunity, I think, within Naval, Naval Air Systems Command and how we're going to uh, move capabilities fast. Can't tell you what that means yet today. Um, but we are aligning and watching what DCO, what Air Force RCO, what other organizations like that, Space Force RCO and others are doing uh, to move forward. Um, and, and across both of our warfare centers, we are, you know, talking to the replicator DCO and how do we move things fast and how we move those technologies. Our chief technology officers across the nav air and each of the warfare centers are aligned. Uh, they have understanding of what the fleet needs, and they're looking through the S&T community and across industry for where those opportunities are, and we can push them through the process. I'll talk from a, a warfare center, specifically my own warfare center or weapons division, uh, we are working very diligently, uh, especially in the weapons and energetic space, but across others as well. Uh, Kratas with companies. Uh, there's a lot of companies that are trying to enter this space today. They understand. Uh, we talked about capacity and other things that we need. We need disruptive technology. We need that in our, in our specific weapons. Uh, we are doing Kratas. We're doing PIAs. Uh, we're doing uh, uh, commercial support agreements. Uh, we have asset, we're organic, whether it's NAVC or NAVWAR or other warfare centers, we have organic availability to support small business and even large business and where you need help. Uh, we have expertise that can help build your business and help you grow in a space. If you're entering a new business area, if you're a small business trying to get into DOD, we have experts that can come alongside and help you grow into that, what that looks like. Uh, I sign, I feel like a, a, a PETA, a CREDA or a CSA almost every other week with another either small or large prime business that we're gonna do additional work with on specific topics uh, in S&T and research and development, specific technology. Uh, the other thing that your warfare centers, your organic warfare centers do is we do a lot of that S&T work and we get patents. We have our own intellectual property and we're happy to share it via license agreements. So if there's technology you think you need, come look, come see what we have. And we're more than happy to negotiate and share that. And I guarantee our license agreements are not as expensive as other industries. Uh, but we want to make sure we're partnering with you, we're building that, and we can continue to develop that technology together. So those are ways we want to disrupt and be partnered together uh, to disrupt the future going forward. Okay, yeah, thanks. Anybody else want to take a crack at that? Good. Okay, um, this is the time you've all been waiting for. We're open up the microphones for anybody that has questions. Um, yes, sir. So good morning, gentlemen. Thank you for uh, being here. Um, I, everybody in their comments kind of rattled off numerous folks, uh, stakeholders in the whole acquisition process. Interestingly, the one stakeholder that I didn't hear mentioned at any point was lawyers. So what I've observed both in my 17 years of acquisition uh, in various parts of DOD and prior career and then now in industry, that there are a lot of authorities and a lot of interesting new uh, or even you know renewed things that you can uh, contracting officers can do on the contracting front. However, uh, they still have their you know 32 point checklist. Got to go through this, 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 and a lot of that is the legal reviews that have to go through. And yet, even though FAR, DFAR, and other things allow the authorities to waive a lot of that, bypass a lot of that, especially if you look at like the 8A program. Um, they just sort of, again, they, it's like, nope, I got to do it. This is the way I was trained. This is the way I was taught. This is, you know, what I learned in a DAU class. I got to do it this way or I'm going to get in trouble. So I would really like to hear from a leadership standpoint, how are you engaging not just with the contracting officers, but also with your legal teams and educating your contracting officers that, yes, you can bypass your checklist, your normal way of doing things, waive a lot of the stuff by regulation, by law, and 
expedite to get things to the warfighter more rapidly through these authorities that you have, and you you won't get in trouble. It's okay. Thank you. Anybody want to take that? I'm happy to start. I, I, I have not had that experience in a long time in acquisition. I mean, yes, we have legal counsel, but they're usually there to help you figure out how to get to yes and to do it within the confines of the law. I mean, that's, that's been my experience. So uh, it doesn't mean that sometimes you can't get there when you're trying to do something that's against the law, but they're the, primarily there to help us get to yes. Um, that's, that's been my experience. I think, I think key to it is they have to be part of that team. Right? It has to be sort of a, a, you know, a buzzword, but a cross-functional team to get to the right business arrangement. They have to be part of that team, um, but but I you know they they have their their role and they do it incredibly well, um, and I think they're they're a key part of the team. So, similar to Admiral Small, the only issues I've seen is where we haven't brought legal in early enough. You know, if you bring them in at the last minute, um, you can find things that decisions that were made early in the process. So just like cybersecurity or any engineering requirements, um, having legal there at the beginning is key. The problem is the volume of contracts and, and acquisitions stretches the, the legal team to be in every IPT meeting, every uh, phase of the process. So uh, our lesson learned and what we're trying to implement is early access to the legal team. Yeah, I think it all comes back to that, that mission focus and the programs being focused on delivering capability. The legal, the council is, is there for a really good reason. We can't break any laws. So they're going to make the program managers aware of where there's risk and where there's, there may be uh, someone crossing a line. And the program managers absolutely have to take that council and uh, work with it. But it's got to be a yes if mentality, mission focused on delivering capability to our Marines, not eliminating any legal risk or any risk of protest or those types of things. So I don't, I have not seen um, a checklist mentality. We encourage critical thinking from our program managers to get through those checklists, to think about what's required, what's not, on the advice of counsel, engineering, or logisticians, everybody else that's involved in the process. Anybody else, anybody disagree with that? Okay. Sure. I agree. You know, lawyers don't, uh, don't make decisions. Uh, they, they give their best advice you know, based on their subject matter expertise. So if we're having delays, it's elsewhere. Yeah. Sir. Good morning, gentlemen. Thank you for being here. Carl Camasco. My question focuses on acquisition security, namely this idea of continuous monitoring of vendors post-contract award. So your contracting professionals are doing an amazing job. They're conducting their responsible contractor assessments prior to contracting award. But as I've engaged these professionals and program managers, there seems to be a challenge to understand the changes in the business entity after a contract award is let. And so I was wondering if you might be able to speak a bit about what your organizations might be doing to identify any risks that might present themselves for a supplier after the contract award. And, and I know for the big primes, DCMA does this very well, but with 50% of contracts being let to small businesses, I've at least perceived this as, as a challenge through my conversations. Thank you, gentlemen. Maybe I want to jump on that grenade first. I'll start. I probably don't have a real satisfying answer for you, but supply chain <laughs> illumination and risk management is, we've got to, it's, it's part of running the program, right? So uh, the challenge we face is there's not a lot of great tools out there that give us real in-depth supply chain illumination and risk management. Uh, risk identification. There's some out there, and I know some of the folks here uh, have, have brought tools to us that get after that, um, but I think we, uh, we don't do a good job of asking for the right stuff in our contracts from our industry partners and uh, having them manage some supply chain illumination, supply chain risk, but it's, it's absolutely a problem that we need to uh, continue to get after. Yeah. Yeah. I, w I would say and the large platforms, large programs, large primes, that's a key responsibility. And I've been on programs and been aligned with programs that, you know, we focus on that topic continually. Uh, we bring in outside entities. We work with the primes to do that supply chain uh, visibility throughout so we can find that security issue. Every time I went to visit, when I was a program manager, every time I went to visit one of our subs or subs of subs of subs, I always asked the question about their supply chain and where things came from. 
and uh, where, how were they handling cybersecurity to protect the, the critical data that they had. Um, and it was interesting the answers I got. And I had one supplier, uh, I think it was a two subs down, had asked that question and, and they were like, I don't know. And they came back a year later and they were so proud to tell me about all the ways they had made changes uh, in their security system and the way they were thinking about their data just because I asked that question. So I think it's a conversation along the way. But you bring up a good point about small business. You know, we, we really rely on some of our prime uh, vendors to do that throughout the supply chain because they are the ones touching the rest of the supply chain. Um, but our small businesses, we have to be there to hold their hands and help guide them and direct them in that. So I think there's a partnership along the way and uh, we have to be in that continual communication. But I guarantee you that uh, leaders are thinking about that. We're focused on it. Um, and if there are good ideas and how we continue to get after the you know, understanding this, uh, where raw materials come from, where uh, our computing environment comes from, where our software comes from. Um, I watch my kids today, they pull software from all kinds of places when they're doing their projects for school. Um, but the reality is, where did that software start? And so if we're, our small businesses and our other areas that are innovative and fast are pulling software code that to be fast, it's already been written, but where did it start and what's inside of it? Uh, and how do we understand that? How do we build tools that can do that kind of peering in and looking at it and looking for those ideas? Thanks. I would just say too, um, you focus on sort of the contracting side of it. It's really on the project management side too. It's, um, they also have a role in keeping an eye on what's going on post-contract award. From the, but from the contracting side, there is always a means of, of um, you know, communicating back to the government, hey, this thing changed in execution. There's always clauses and things like that that, that allow for that. I don't know the specific case that you're talking about, but there is always a way for us to communicate on those fact of life things that happen post-contract award, always. So just the key is communication, but across the whole team to include the contracting officer. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Next question. Hi, Alberg, U.S. Naval Institute member. Uh, from the First World War to the war in Ukraine, wars have always lasted longer than people expected if they're against major powers, and ammunition use has way exceeded expectations and production capacity. It was a war game last year conducted by CSIS, you may be familiar with, where in three weeks we expended all of our long-range anti-ship munitions, which would take years to replace. Other than money, what do you see are the bottlenecks to increase our production capacity of consumables for a major conflict against a peer competitor so that we are ready when such a conflict begins? So with regard to uh, Munitions Warfare Center, we're definitely focused on uh, increasing our collaboration with industry uh, so that we have more capability and capacity uh, with industry. Uh, recently had a, a public-private partnership uh, between Indian Head and uh, L3 Harris, Aerojet Rocketdyne uh, signed for increased uh, production capability going into the future taking a lot of what we have on the shelf in inventory and being innovative with what we have uh, and, and applying it to the fight today and in the future. Uh, we're finding novel ways to, to add that uh, to our bench depth. And we're investing a lot in our own arsenal, our own organic capability uh, to increase production. Uh, so that's not tomorrow, but it's right around the corner where we'll see uh, traction there. Um, so from a Warfare Center standpoint, that's not just, uh, it's kind of across all domains too. It's not, I, I, and when I say munitions or effectors, uh, that's both kinetic and non-kinetic. Uh, but your example sounds more kinetic and, and uh, we're doing a lot in that space right now. We work closely with the Army as we manage those drawdowns and we keep an eye on our munitions. Key to that, and this is a, so that's a, it's a DOD problem, it's just a, not a Navy and Marine Corps problem and how we build up our defense infrastructure. I'd encourage you to go look at the National Defense Infrastructure Strategy. It just came out recently, and they talk about four areas. One is the resilient supply chain, and that goes back to our, just the conversation we just had about supply chain illumination and risk management, seeing where those risks are and shoring up those risk areas. Workforce readiness, everything from the technical STEM-type workforce through our industrial workforce, and I think NAVC probably sees it more acutely than anybody else, the shortage we have in our industrial workforce, Fle uh, flexible acquisition strategies that we've talked a little bit about, and then economic deterrence. So look through those. That's the DOD's 
strategy for getting after those um, infrastructure and industrial-based problems. Yeah, I'll just say a couple of things uh, that we're doing. At advocacy has been a big part of communicating with our resource providers, our congressional leaders, the folks that uh, you know provide our budgets every year. Uh, in recent budget, there's been some investment in some of that industrial base, specifically in the weapons portfolios. Um, there's also some of that investment's gone into supporting key weapons like Tomahawk, El Razm, AIM 9X, and others. Um, that organic collaboration that Tom talked about here, uh, doing that is important. Uh, both Indian Head and uh, China Lake have, have been very focused on collaborating with each other and with uh, industry on how do we build up that both organic and industrial surge capacity. Uh, but that gets at to the, the knowledge sharing and that gets back into, hey, we have to be open and honest with one another about the technical aspects of it. And so we need one of the bottlenecks is ready technical data packages for some of these key munitions and key weapons that we have out there. Are, are they really ready to go if we need to surge uh, that we could share that with another company. If that company that we would go with and they're, they're at, at the bottleneck, they can't expand any faster, how can we share that technical package and be able to ramp up quickly? And so that requires us to be focused uh, and, and collaborating with the technical data to make that happen. Uh, new technologies, how do we transfer those quickly so that we can integrate them into uh, the capacity weapons that we need to have? And then how do we go rapidly with open systems to create capacity weapons at a lower cost point than we are today. We can't wait 10 to 15 years and build all up rounds. Sometimes we've got to build pieces and parts and then stitch them together in an open system way of doing it. Uh, and that's some of that knowledge and learning is going to be really important for us to build the capacity that we will need to surge if, if that time comes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Sir, next question. Yeah, Paul Rosbolt from uh, Systems Planning and Analysis. Uh, Tom, I, I was glad to hear you mention the tech bridges. Uh, I did some consulting work for Naval X, and they had me go visit one of those tech bridges. Uh, and actually, it, it's associated with one of your warfare centers, but I'll, I'll leave them nameless. Uh, but some observations. One is that most of their money came not from Navy, but from state and local sources. Second was that they didn't have a big picture sense of Navy requirements coming down to them that they should then transmit out to their bridge ecosystem members. And third, their, their observation of the SBIR program was that it was not particularly effective in that even when they got SBIRs to phase three, so they were producing something, transition rate into a program of record was actually very low. So I think I'd turn the question to all of you, and particularly you, Tom. Do you think you are using those tech bridges effectively? And on the SBIR program, do you concur with their observation? And if so, what should you be doing to make that program more effective? Yeah, so thanks for the uh, question, Paul. Uh, so what you know, General Walsh talked about with tech transition and uh, Secretary Gurdon's comments there, it is challenging. Uh, obviously, we want each of these tech bridges to be attractive for people to come, for uh, non-traditional providers, local providers uh, to come in, get connected, and, and uh, achieve value out of it. Um, is there a guarantee a super uh, phase? Phase three is going to transition to a program record. No, but I would, I'd argue that there's great value in additional players getting in that ecosystem, getting experience with the government, understanding what right looks like. Um, I'll take your comment about you know, an experience where you go to a tech bridge and you don't really understand what the Navy's looking for. We should do better there. Uh, on the government side, we need to be very clear on what we need and, and how to connect. Uh, so if the connection's there, that's great. But if uh, folks are coming in and, and they don't know what value the Navy's looking for, then uh, then we're missing the mark there. So appreciate that feedback. Um, the funding source is, a, I mean, what a win-win. We really have outstanding Americans uh, and outstanding organizations around the country that support economic development. So we want to harness it uh, to, the, to the best of our ability and appreciate the feedback. Thank you. All right, thank you. Yes, sir. 
Good morning, Doug Thompson, Grand Estate Manufacturing, small business manufacturer. Most of our work is supporting U.S. Navy platforms. All of our production work is through the primes. Works well for us. Uh, obviously, we're busy like most people here. Uh, my worry is spares. We get a huge number of small RFQs for different spare parts. We have a big installed base. It's incredibly inefficient. It's very expensive. It has long lead times. I know General Walsh, you mentioned colors of money and other barriers that are in the way, but is there, is there any hope that in our production contracts we could roll in at least some reasonable projections of spares? Because it would just be so much more cost effective, so much more schedule effective, and would allow us to stay focused on the production programs, which, you know, in the capacity challenges of the industrial base, we've got to do that. And I'm just, I'm just very concerned that the spares are going to fall very far behind. Yes. Yeah, I'll, I'll start off with that a little bit. Um, I, what you are saying is, is pervasive. Those small orders that just disrupt the business, that create a lot of work for a, a little bit of gain is, is a pain. And that's been ongoing for a long time. Um, I even go back to my experiences as a major program manager. We saw that in our supply chain. And, uh, and I had to work di diligently to try to look at how do we solve that problem. Uh, that gets back to partnership and collaboration. And that forecasting is exactly it. Uh, Naval Air Systems Command is working diligently with uh, the Defense Logistics Agency and with Navy Supply to understand that. I mean, to digitize the data, to look further out, to use our engineering data in some of, as we digitize the systems and, and understand the models that support uh, our future forecasts, they'll get better. Um, and, and some of that is uh, we need to use them, as I'm a part of it, say, use the machines to do what machines do well, and they do that if you feed the right data into it. So we got to get our data right, and we need to have the algorithms and the work and using uh, uh, machine learning and other things to help us create those forecasts, and then we need to share them. Um, but I guarantee you, your experience today is probably widespread uh, that we continue to see those problems, and we need to get better at it every day. But there is work in that space uh, through our sustainment activities, through our collaboration across the warfare centers. Um, there's a lot of focus you see on Columbia Submarine and on shipbuilding. Well, there's a lot of material that we in aviation use that are from the same suppliers and the same uh, pieces. And so how do we bring visibility to that? So when there's an order going in, like, okay, they're going to order 100. Can you give us five more? You know, that kind of thing so that you're not getting uh, piecemeal orders along the way. So looking for, if you got ideas, Please keep sharing that up through your chains uh, with us today, whatever you, you want to do about how we, if you've got a better way to solve that problem. Uh, but I know people are actively working on how to do better forecasting, to share that forecast, and to align our buying as a, a Navy and as a DOD so that uh, we can buy more in bulk and give you the forecast that you need uh, to have that steady understanding of uh, to set up your production lines in the most efficient way possible. So. I think your demand for as a sub a supplier to some of the primes comes from two primary areas. One is production on new platforms, where you're going to see that demand mm -hmm. uh, as a result of, for instance, a multi-year buy. So, on the procurement side, I don't know if you look at that piece of the budget, we can do better working with Congress to get more multi-year authorities and things like that. They give you more stability on that side. On the other side of it, on the spares uh, demand. That's a little bit tougher because it does, just like Brownie mentioned, get into our log IT systems, the data we use to predict our, our, our demand on the spare side. We, as we make that shift from efficiency into more effectiveness, in this, in this case, mission availability or readiness, we know we're going to use, for the most part, we know we're going to use parts over time. We have gotten ourselves working with our supply, um, our government supply teams to a point where we're buying just in time. We're not keeping stuff on the shelf because we're being as efficient as possible. That's great for efficiency, not so good for readiness and effectiveness. So I hope we will have the authority and the money to change that that uh, that paradigm a little bit. Yeah, for, I'd just like to echo, first of all, uh, having sat up on this panel many times, that, that's exactly the type of feedback that I guarantee these gentlemen are looking to get. And uh, that, you know, it's a thoughtful question. With, with actually a proposed solution. This is uh, kind of preaching to the choir to everybody else out there. It's not whining. Um, and you might think these gentlemen are all knowing, all powerful, and uh, maybe Doug is, mm -hmm. but um, 
you know, where we sit, where they sit, they, they sometimes they don't see what you see. And so these forums are great, but, you know, I think uh, Emil Small earlier said, hey, if you, if you can't get through my organization, send me a note. I think, you know, I, I probably speak for the other uh, gentleman on the stage, uh, you know, th they would take that feedback too. So th thank you for that question. It was really good. Appreciate it. Yeah. Okay, ma'am. Thank you all so much for being here. My name is Madison Lumberg. I work with the NAVC SBIR program. Um, something that we have heard is that contracting takes uh, four to six months to make the award, and that isn't sustainable for a lot of the small businesses, and they're having to lay off uh, some employees while awaiting for the contract award. And so I'm wondering uh, how we can make them a priority to keep our industrial base strong. It's a great question, uh, and right away I, I want to help. Uh, so I appreciate the feedback. Um, four to six months is way too long for you know a small business involved in SBIR. So I'll just acknowledge that that's. Uh, um, I'm guessing there's probably not the best comms in place when something like that is going on, or not a team integrated approach where everybody has their eye on the ball. Um, so we've got work to do there. I'd love to see you afterwards take that feedback. Just, uh, I would say too, you know, the Secretary of the Navy has been pretty clear that the priority needs to be on small business and small business contracting, small business funding um, ahead of, you know, I mean, in the prioritization scheme, they need to be the priority. So I, I don't know the specific issue of four to six months, but um, it doesn't need to be that way. And it, it, some of it goes back to what are you procuring from the small business and how are you procuring it? But um, it's a, it is a SECNAV priority, and, and truthfully, you know, in the grand scheme, we set records last year in terms of our naval performance with small business. So um, we are getting a little bit better in the prioritization, but those individual eaches are absolutely a problem that we are charged with getting after. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I will just real quickly, over, uh, any, anybody have any last closing comments or anything they feel compelled to tell the audience? Yeah, Doug, over here. I would, I would just like to go back to the, the, the question that, that you asked actually on the uh, production and, and speed. And I think, you know, it's, it's one of these things kind of going back to even Admiral Paparo's comments on, you know, efficiency versus effectiveness. In some of these cases, we're down to where we're buying these really expensive, really exquisite things, and we want to buy more of them, and it just costs, uh, you know, so much. It's why things like the things that we talked about earlier, the Disruptive Capabilities Office, you know, that name, Disruptive, was chosen for a reason. It's how do you get around problems like that that are seemingly intractable. Some of these really exquisite systems with the supply chain issues and everything, and the cost, frankly, the price of them, they're just, they, they present themselves as intractable, and so how do you pivot around that? That's why we have such a focus on unmanned systems, driving autonomy to the edge, things like that, because we have to come up with solutions that move around that while getting Admiral Paparo and our warfighters the effect that they need um, in theater. So that was, that was the last thing I wanted to say. I would just circle back to the way I started, the, you know, the Coast Guard building a, a more global, more integrated fleet. And the way we're doing that, the way we're trying to get more players on the field is going as fast as we can on procurements. We're doing six, six different ship classes, but also service life extensions of the existing fleet where industry helps us uh, replace engines, generators, guns, electronics, radars uh, to keep our existing fleet going. Uh, and the addition of as many Navy-type, Navy-owned systems as we can so that Coast Guard cutters are interchangeable uh, and add to the global fleet. Yeah, I'll just close by saying thank you for all for this opportunity. The collaboration really is key to making sure our Marines get what they need, whether it's with industry, our joint partners, our international partners. There are so many opportunities out there to accelerate the process, get things out there more quickly. And where there's friction and there's a, you know, a, a risk to opportunity, please elevate that. Let us know so we can get through that together. So I think just uh, thank you again for the collaboration. Thank you for the time today. I'll also say thank you. And uh, I would say the opportunities now are growing uh, more than they've ever been before. I, I didn't kind of point to it before, but there's more being contracted uh, to industry now than ever before, and that's increasing.
So there's, there's value coming from you. Maritime superiority is not just going to come from our government workforce. Uh, it's one team uh, and we can only do it together. So thanks for the opportunity and look forward to the future with you. I'll echo. Uh, thank you. Appreciate the uh, questions, the feedback. Uh, appreciate uh, your attendance here today and, and having the conversation. Look forward to uh, interacting with you the rest of the day as we walk around. Um, just kind of reminder, we want to kind of start off with, you know, Naval Air Systems Command is focused on an abundance and growth mindset, and I think it's across the board here. You know, what can we achieve with what we have? What are the innovative ideas to change the game uh, that doesn't require more people, more money, more resources, but we prioritize them in different ways. And so we look forward to having those conversations. We have success stories that have happened. Teams have both industry and government gotten together and they've solved the problem. They've cut half the time and half the cost. And it wasn't by cutting half the profit. It was by cutting costs out of the system. Uh, and they've had that success with that collaboration like you've heard us talk about it. So I think there are shining examples and we just need to move those examples and, and uh, share that learning around so we can all get better a little bit at a time with that growth mindset. So thanks for your time today. We get a round of applause for our panelists, please. Our more panel members, thank you so much. On behalf of the Naval Institute and FCA International, we want to thank you each for your time today and your insights. We have a copy of a book, a Naval Institute press book, Mars Adapting Military Change During War by Frank G. Hoffman. Uh, for the audience members, thank you for your participation and your great questions. And before you go to your next event, I would ask you to please provide some feedback on the West app on this uh, panel discussion today. Thank you all again. Oh my gosh. Ladies and gentlemen, as you are leaving, I want to remind you that this session is recommended for maintenance of acquisition training certifications. If you would like to receive documentation for your attendance at this session, please stop and scan your badge on the way out of the room.